Today on the Bandy Says Podcast, we are going to be discussing how the angle of a microphone affects the sound. We'll be talking about down payments on homes, the Shure SM7B running into Focusrite audio interfaces, and other stuff too, so go ahead and stick around. And we are going to start with what I have been testing, and I am going to say the thing. You have been listening to it for about 30 seconds. It is the microphone. The microphone that I am using is the Telefunken TF51. If you are not familiar with this microphone, this is a multi-pattern tube condenser microphone. I am using it in cardioid mode because I am the only sound source that I'm recording with it. I don't need anything behind it. I don't need all of it because it does have figure eight and omni. Don't need those polar patterns, so cardioid mode. I am running into the Rodecaster Pro 2 still, still avoiding the gate. But the reason I threw this on the stand, I have already used it for a month on the podcast maybe a year, maybe two years ago, because I bought this about two years ago. (laughs) I have been putting off a lot of videos. Can you tell? But I have included this in a couple of podcastage, podcastage. Why did I say podcast? (laughs) Really weird. I didn't enunciate or pronounce the P in podcastage at all. That was a very weird thing to do. But I have included this in a couple of podcasted videos in the comparison section, and it's been holding its own. It's been very refreshing to go to this in the comparison section and having that context. What was that click? Not going to do anything about it. Going to leave it in. We'll determine if that was the microphone or the mixer somehow. I'm guessing it's the microphone. But it has been a very refreshing sound in the comparison section because it's very bright, but it doesn't sound lopsided. It's very airy, but it doesn't sound brittle or glassy as some people call it. It just offers a... It has that weight to it to offset the brightness, the airiness, and it's just a really cool sounding microphone. I think I am finally going to be able to determine and state whether I like the TF-47 or the TF-51 better. And I'll put it this way. Now I really want to try the Elam 251 even more. (laughs) I think you can guess what my conclusion will be. And that's pretty much all that I'm testing. That is all that I'm testing. Let us jump to what you had to say. And the first comment comes from Sound Speeds. And he actually, it comes from, oh no, is it dead? It's dead. That's not good. Alan, I need a new one. I need I need a new panic button because it's broken. Okay. The first comment comes from sound speeds. I already did the thing. Don't need to redo it. And he says, the 416 overhead only gave me more questions. This is why I always suggest people put a camera on themselves and record themselves positioning the microphone in different angles while talking. Then watch back and listen, listen, listen. Where does the microphone sound best? Tweak the mic placement and you're golden. My question, Bandrew, is this. Did you do this when you placed the 416 shotgun downwards on you at your table? Underneath, it looked angled harder off the monitor when underneath than overhead, and that matters. Keep this up, and I may have to fly out there and boom an episode of the podcast. The big takeaway from this should be that boom operators are very talented at microphone placement. Alan, thank you very much for the comment. I appreciate it. To respond to you, I am going to do a couple more tests. Currently, I have the MKH-416 underboomed in the same position that I had or a similar position as I did last week. And it is about 20 degrees off axis from the desk. So it has quite a drastic angle against the desk. Not going to be pointed directly down at it going to be pointed opposite from the desk. Now I am going to switch this overhead. Also, I pulled out my measuring tape. I am about nine inches away from the mic. I will try to mimic this overhead booming. 
And now I have the MKH416 overhead booming at a similar angle against the desk. The issue with this is it's so apparently in frame. And when I was trying to get it out of frame, it would have to be a more drastic angle or it would have to be significantly farther away from me. So I do agree, this sounds much better than last week's episode because it was a much more drastic angle and I am conceding to your expertise and booming. That was just picking up all the reflections off the desk. This doesn't sound as reflective. It doesn't solve the issue of having it out of frame though. Let's see what I would have to do to get it out of frame. So there we go. And I have the secondary angle up so you can actually see what I'm doing. That's about as good as I can get, although it is still in frame. If you are watching the video as I tap the foam, I'm sure that's not annoying at all. Still not my favorite sound. I understand people do enjoy this. It sounds more natural because when we are talking to somebody, we're not right in their ear, <laughs> or at least I hope we're not right in somebody's ear just speaking to them two or three inches away from their eardrum. I get that. So this sounds more realistic. This sounds more like you were having a conversation with somebody, what they would actually hear. I just prefer that close, intimate sound. <laughs> But I do agree with the big takeaway from last week's episode and your comment. This should be that boom operators are very, very talented at microphone placement. I agree with that completely. Not going to deny that. I think boom operators are very talented. That's why they earn the big bucks. And that's why boom operators are so essential for sound on film and television. Not radio, though. And, and just, to, just to tick you off, you know what sucks? Shotgun microphones. <laughs> Shotgun microphones are for stupid people. <laughs> anyway, there you go. Those are my tests to respond to your question. Yes, the angle was very different last week from under-booming to over-booming. This is more consistent. I am now no longer at 9 inches away. I am at 12 and a half inches away from the boom mic. So it is from the shotgun microphone. And let's actually go ahead and try to, one last thing, we'll mimic this from under booming. So 12 and a half inches at this angle from the desk. What am I saying? I don't know what I'm saying. I'm going to change it now. And the final position we have is the MKH416 under booming me at 12 and a half inches away. Different sound. I do hear a bit more almost slap back on this position at 12 and a half inches. So I just wouldn't use this. I don't like this. But I'm also monitoring in real time. So not very useful for making any determination. Okay, that is it. That is my response to you, Alan. Thank you very much for the feedback and calling me out on being stupid. Appreciate it. Don't fly out here and boom me in person. That would be terrifying. Maybe one day we can do that. That would be a funny experiment. Next comment comes from Eldest. He says, if you sold every one of your microphones and preamps, how comfortable would you be putting a down payment on a new house? Eldis, thank you very much for the comment. I want to clarify something. My objection is not to the down payment. My objection is to the monthly cost. Now, I have been saving up for a down payment for four years at this point, and I have a pretty good lump sum of money. Let us go ahead and jump back into Excel. Not going to be a crazy Excel day like last week, but I want to show something. Now we are in the exact same spreadsheet as last week, but I have added one additional line. I will give a quick recap of what the spreadsheet demonstrates. It starts with a gross income of somebody who is in between a master's degree and a bachelor's degree because a bachelor's typically earns around 65 k a year salary, and somebody with a master's degree earns about $78,000 a year. This averages to $71,500 dues. Then we remove insurance, retirement, and taxes, 
and we can then calculate our monthly take-home pay. And with that information, we're able to calculate what percentage of our income would need to be allocated to housing to actually get into a mortgage now. And the reason I'm bringing all of this up is to indicate that a large down payment of 20% really doesn't change much. All of the figures that we looked at last week took into account a 20% down payment. That is the baseline in the mortgage calculator I was using. So when I was saying we could afford a $126,000 home, which would lead to a $910 a month mortgage, that means that we put down $25,300 and borrowed $101,000. And being that the vast majority of homes are $300,000, $350,000 to $450,000, you will have a down payment between $62,000 and maybe $90,000. But that still leads to the monthly payment that ends up being between 50 and 70% of your monthly income. So yes, in theory, I could sell all of my microphones, all of my preamps, all of my audio equipment, and increase my down payment. But if I am putting a down payment on a $450,000 home, and I can put down the 20% equaling $91,360, that still means my monthly mortgage payment is going to be $2,500. That is still a lot of money. And in the scenario that we have drawn out here, that would be 70% of this person's income. And yes, you are only borrowing $365,000 at 6.3% over 30 years. But that just goes to show that the down payment isn't really the main contributing factor to the unaffordability of homes. Because I have saved for four years and I have a good chunk of money saved for a down payment, but I would be putting a down payment on a home that I think is unaffordable because the monthly payments would still be crazy. So there you go. That's my answer. Yes, I could put a down payment. Right now, I could put a very good down payment on a home at the current home prices, but the monthly payment would still be unaffordable for me. There you go, eldest. I appreciate it. And I think this may conclude the mortgage talk unless there's more stuff that comes up. It's super interesting. And I know this is just looking at a very specific part of the calculation because the mortgage market is so much more than price. I, I get that. This is just me doing quick math or maths to understand where the market is for me. I'm not saying this is where the market ought to be moving for everybody. I'm just saying I'm out. I'm out right now. <laughs> if it goes down, cool. If it doesn't, whatever. I'm out. I'm out. All right. Thank you very much, Eldest. I appreciate you. And now we have super thanks. We have a couple thanks to give. Number one, to TechMed Rainer Richter for 10 euro. Then to TechMed Rainer Richter for 10 euro. And then to TechMed Rainer Richter for 5 euro, totaling 25 euro of super thanks. Thank you very much, super producer, thanks a lot, executive, exe executive producer, associate, I don't know the terminology. <laughs> Thank you very much for the super thanks, Rainer Richter. Appreciate you so much for the constant support. You are a legend. And now, let us jump to my favorite part of the show, the Ask Bandrew segment. Welcome back to the Ask Bandrew segment, the segment where you ask me, Bandrew, and I answer you, listener, submitter, questionnaire, whatever the terminology it is that you prefer. If you want to ask a question, go to Ask bandrew.com. There are instructions on how to send in audio, video, and text. I do prefer audio and video submissions sub one minute because it gives you a break from me, which is great. And we get to hear how you sound on your audio equipment, which is also great. We have two voice submissions. And then finally, we are caught up. Can you believe it? We are caught up. <laughs> now I need more. Send in more questions. <laughs> First voice submission comes from unnamed. Take it away, unnamed individual. Hi, Andrew. 
I recently got a Behringer XM8500 and a Euphoria UM2 to replace a $10 USB mic. I only use it for voice chat, mainly on Discord. When I record on Audacity, the, the difference is huge, but when I asked my friends on Discord which one sounded better, they said they sound about the same. Is Discord audio always bad or am I doing something wrong? Any advice, uh, any advice would be appreciated. Thanks for everything. Unnamed individual, thank you very much for the voice submission. To reiterate the question, you're saying that you record your audio in Audacity and then the quality between the Audacity recording and Discord is very different. I am a bit confused by your question because you mentioned that your friends think the recording and the Discord voice call sound similar. I'm going to assume that you misspoke and that your friends say that the recording and your Discord voice call sound drastically different. Otherwise, you wouldn't be asking this question. So to address the question directly, does Discord destroy audio? No. Discord uses the Opus Audio Codec, and it can get pretty high quality. We have 256 kilobits per second audio in the podcast Discord server, I think. And it sounds great. It sounds really, really good. So Discord should not be the contributing factor in taking good sounding audio and destroying it for the people on the other end. Because I don't have any more information, I don't know what the actual complaints are. That would have been very helpful. Is it that it sounds distant? Does the audio sound distorted? Do you sound robotic? What is the actual issue that the people on the call are hearing? Since I don't have that, I just have a bunch of suggestions that I'm going to recommend. And hopefully, this is going to address the issue. Suggestion number one. If the microphone sounds distant and terrible... Make sure that you have the correct microphone selected as your audio or microphone input in Discord. This is something that happens a lot. Windows or Discord or something automatically changes the microphone input sometimes and selects the computer's internal microphone. If you're talking into your microphone four inches away and your computer is two and a half feet away, It's going to sound terrible when you have the computer's internal microphone picking you up. So make sure that you have the correct microphone input selected in Discord. Two, if the people on the call say that your microphone is too quiet, make sure that your gain is set well and correctly. Now I understand, I've always said around negative 18 to negative 12, If you're really confident in your speaking level, go up to negative six for recording. But if you are not doing any processing, if you don't have the ability to add the limiter in between the audio being converted and then going into Discord, you may have to be a bit more aggressive with the gain and risk clipping a little bit. Because it's in a voice call, I don't think it's the biggest deal if you get a little bit distorted as long as you are not distorting 24 hours a day, the entire time you're talking, then that's fine. If you just clip a little bit while you're laughing in a voice call, I don't think there's anything to really complain about as long as your levels are listenable. So you may have to be a little bit more aggressive and run the gain on your interface a bit hotter if you are running into Discord and you don't have any way of adding a limiter or adding digital gain in between the conversion and Discord. That's suggestion two. Increase the gain if the mic is too quiet. Third, if the people think your audio is distorting or don't think, hear your audio distorting. Number one, make sure your gain is set up appropriately and you are not clipping. I'm assuming you are not because you're saying the recording in Audacity sounds good, but the people on the other end have an issue. If they hear you clipping, make sure your audio is set appropriately, the levels, And then make sure that they do not have you set at 200%. I had this issue where I thought, oh my gosh, how is somebody in my voice call sounding this distorted? This is terrible. 
turn down your gain. And then I looked. Oh, I had them set at 200%. When I dropped them to 100%, they sounded fantastic. So if the issue is clipping, if you are not clipping on your end and you know you are not clipping on your end, then make sure they don't have you boosted 200% in Discord because that will, can, I should say, that can lead to distortion on their end. And the final suggestion, this is suggestion number four, make sure that crisp noise removal is turned off. Discord has improved this a lot. When it initially rolled out the initial beta test, (laughs) it was brutal. It sounded like you were listening at 8 kilobits per second. It was horrible sounding. Now, it actually sounds pretty decent, where you don't have a massive change when you flip it on or off. So I doubt that would be the contributing factor now, but that's another thing to try out, another thing to check. Make sure crisp is turned off, and if it is, then check the other three things. Those are all the recommendations I have. If you're robotic, I know you're not using the focus right, the focus right 2i2 and so all the focus right stuff I think on Windows does have an issue where it will go robotic. Maybe they resolved that, I'm not sure. But that is resolved by unplugging and plugging back in. Okay. That's all the suggestions that I have for you. Best of luck, unnamed individual. And let me know if that works. Let me know what the issue was if you are still listening to this. And next question, next voice submission comes from Gino. Take it away, Gino. Hello, Bandrew. My name is Gino. I wanted to go ahead and ask if there is anything wrong with using something such as the Focusrite Solo whenever it comes down to using something such as a Shure SM7B. Now, currently, I'm not using an SM7B. I am using a SM58 inside of the body of a HyperX quadcast, so I kind of have like my own little homemade Shure SM7B. Anyway, I'm only asking because whenever I see people talking about the SM7B and what a good budget interface would be is the Focusrite 2i2. I don't know if the Solo is worse than the 2i2 or if it's just at the same quality it's something that i'm not really too aware of uh (laughs) goodbye i'm not really good with ending conversations peace gino thank you very much for the voice submission to reiterate the question you're asking is there anything wrong with using the Shure SM7B with the Focusrite Scarlet Solo? You mentioned that people use the 2i2 as a good budget option or entry-level option for the SM7B, but you are unsure if the Scarlet Solo is any good. To answer the question, yes. I'm assuming that you are referring to Generation 3 of the Scarlet series, and if that's the case... I will go ahead and put specs up on the screen right here, but the preamps are identical. The preamps between the Focusrite Scarlet Solo 3rd Gen and the Focusrite 2i2 3rd Gen are identical. So if you are listening to the Shure SM7B running through the Focusrite Scarlet 2i2 3rd Gen and you think, wow, that's more than acceptable then the answer would be yes, the Scarlet Solo is sufficient for the Shure SM7B. Currently, I am running the SM7B and do the Focusrite Scarlet 18i20 second gen. This has a worse noise floor than the 2i2 or the Solo third gen. Not by much, by 1 dBUA weighted, if I'm not mistaken. And I asked Focusrite why that's the case. With the 18i20, it actually requires an external power source, and that addition of mains power increases the noise floor slightly. So if you're listening to this and thinking, wow, that's acceptable, then yes, the Scarlet Solo or the Scarlet 2i2 3rd Gen, both of those 3rd Gen, would be more than sufficient for the SM7B. Now, chances are, you will need to have your gain set at 100%, which is what I have right now. I have my gain set at 100%, and I am about 
three inches off, two, three inches off the end of the SM7B neutral mode, if I am not mistaken. Let me double check. Yes, we are in neutral mode, which is my favorite setting for this microphone. I think the high pass filter is a bit aggressive. I don't like the presence boost. I like it just dark and smooth, and I know that will drive people crazy. Oh my god, it's so dark. Are you talking into a blanket? I like it. It's easy to listen to. Get off my case. <laughs> it's not terrible. Anyway, let me go ahead and I will speak. This is how I sound speaking. Gain it 100%. Now I'll shut up and you can hear the noise floor. Three, two, one. And now I am back. But now I'm going to do something else because I am somewhat of a loud talker. I will go ahead and whisper. It's going to be creepy. <laughs> I'm going to hate every second of it. But I will whisper and then I will increase my volume so that my whispering speaking voice is at a good level. And then I'll be quiet so you can hear the noise floor and determine if you think that is acceptable for your use case. If you think that's too noisy Whatever your thoughts are, you can make up your own mind on it. I'm just giving you the examples. Now let's get creepy. Okay, it's very early in the morning, and I am still drinking my second cup of coffee. Discord partner for life. Actually not for life. They will kick you out. <laughs> I've gotten a couple of warnings. Hey, you fell below the threshold. We're going to kick you out. But this is me whispering, and I am creeping myself out. I hate how I sound. But now... We have that bass line. I will have increased the volume to make it listenable. Now I'll shut up and let you hear the noise floor. Three, two, one, and we're back. So there you go, Gino. I hope that answered your question, but also gave you a bit more information. To answer the question directly, the Solo and the 2i2 3rd Gen have identical preamps, so if you think the 2i2 3rd Gen is sufficient, then yes, the Solo would be sufficient, but I wanted to give you actual demonstrations so you can make up your own mind based on your ears, and you don't have to look at some figures on a spec sheet that might not mean that much to you. There you go. Thank you. And that is the end of the Ask Bantru segment. Now we are jumping to the movie of the week, and we have a good one. This week's movie of the week is The Man Who Killed Hitler and Then The Bigfoot. How is that for a title? This is from 2018, stars Sam Elliott and Aiden Turner. I blind bought this in 2018 at Best Buy. I went in to look for a DVD, and I saw this... I saw the title and said, yes, please, don't mind if I do. Took me four years to get around to watching it, but maybe it was 2019 that I bought it. I don't know. Totally worth it. Totally worth it. With a title like that, you would be expecting one of the schlockiest schlockfests to ever schlock about on film. No, it is not that at all. It does have a little bit of goofiness. It does have a little bit of, of over-the-topness. But it struck me because it is much more character-driven than anything. You do get a little bit of flashbacks going to World War II. You do have a little bit of hunting Bigfoot. But that's not the thing that stands out. If that's all that it was, I don't think it would be good. I don't think that I would be... I would have enjoyed it. I don't think that I would be recommending it. Because of all the character-driven stuff and Sam Elliott's performance, that's why I'm recommending it. He's such a likable character, and you just want him to be well. I don't, I don't know. I just like his character so much, and I want him to succeed in all that he does, and I want him to be happy. There was... It's very rare for a movie to make me speak out loud. And there was <laughs> there was one scene where I said, no, turn around. <laughs> I actually was forced 
involuntarily to scream at the movie, turn it around, turn it around. And that's a very rare thing. That's a very rare thing. Enunciate Bandru. That's the movie of the week that I am recommending. And that's pretty much all that I've got this week. I have fallen back into olden traps. I am recording this Sunday morning, the day that it comes out. I swore I wouldn't be doing this, but frankly, I wasn't thinking I was going to do an episode. And then this morning I realized, oh God, I'm, I'm feeling like such a lazy bum. I need to do something. I need to accomplish something. I can't be a complete worthless layabout accomplishing zero. What an absolute bum and a half. So, I just kind of wung, wung it, winged it, wing it. What would the, the past tense, I winged it, I winged it, is how it would go. That's correct. And here we are. I quickly pulled questions, what she had to say. I opened up Excel again and rock and roll. I wish I had done this over the week, though. I had a bunch of meetings last week that ended up taking all day long. And then by the end of the day working, it ended up being a couple 11 and a half hour days at work. I just said, I, I can't record anything. <laughs> I'm just whooped. I want to just be a worthless layabout. But now when it's Sunday and I should be a worthless layabout, I opt to record because I took enough time off. I took enough time off when I couldn't record because of leaky roof thing. And no, they haven't resolved it yet. One day they will. Who cares? Maybe the mold will kill me before anything else. I don't think there's mold. Maybe there is. Who knows? How do you know? Who knows? Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? That's the bottom line. Just apathy. Apathy in the most positive way. I'm rambling. And this goes back to a comment that Soundspeed's left. <laughs> he was saying... I don't remember what he was saying. He was pointing out how I was walking through my outline, how I prepare for a podcast to stay on topic. And then within two minutes, I was talking about how in the 1600s, I would be burned at the stake and that I was possessed by Satan. <laughs> it's pretty talented. Pretty. It takes a lot of talent to go from, here is how I pre prepare for a podcast to, if I was alive in the 1600s, I would be murdered because people would believe that I was possessed by Satan and communing with the devil. Talented. That's what we call it. All right. That's all that I've got for you this week. I appreciate you. I love you. You are amazing. I hope you have an amazing Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Next Sunday, I will talk at you. Go out and kick butt this week. Go do something just tremendous drink a lot of water too okay what am i talking about why this has been a geeks rising production your executive producer is bandrew scott for more information head over to www.geeksrising.com.